Hey guys, it's our special Christmas edition of The Ascent. My name is Angela Erickson and I host a, a podcast YouTube channel called Integrated with Angela Erickson. And this is everyone's favorite Thomas, Nicholas Cavazos, the traditional Thomas. Thanks for coming back on for another edition of The Ascent. How are you doing? I'm good. Everyone should subscribe to my channel because it's the only cool channel. Excuse <laughs> me? <laughs> is this, are, we, are we competing now? Definitely not. It was actually funny. So it's like every time I go to the monastery, like every single month, I only have people who recognize me and they're like, you're from like the internet, right? They'll just say something like the internet. I'm like, that's so broad. What is that? You're an mean? internet person. And so I've been kind of tempted just to troll with people and like, right, subscribe to the traditional Thomas and just put it in like notable Catholic places, you know? So it's like, there's a viewer in Rome who just wants to type out subscribe to the traditional Thomas and like go hanging on the Vatican's door. That'd be pretty epic. Oh my goodness. That would be, well, yeah, maybe, maybe we need a, a few more Thomas in the Vatican right now, <laughs> but Absolutely. on another note, we're here to talk about atheists, <laughs> atheists today, which, you know, sometimes it feels like we have atheists running the show. Oh, 100%. We 100% have atheists running the show. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, okay. What, what prompted this conversation? We we were talking, uh, I don't know, a month or two ago. We were planning out upcoming shows. We were like, what do we want to talk about for Christmas? And I believe it was you that said, we should really talk about and, and ask the question, why do atheists even bother celebrating Christmas? Because they don't believe in Christ. Um, what made you think that this is a topic we should cover? I think it's just like, and probably everyone can relate you're hanging out, right? It comes to the end of the year. It's usually like right before Thanksgiving now. And you start seeing all the stores put out Christmas stuff. And when I was a kid, you know, Christmas, you know, it was just that magical time of the year. You're excited for presents. You're excited for like the nippiness in the air. You got to see snow, right? So that's pretty cool. I never saw Not this snow. year. Not oh my this goodness. Year. We don't have any snow. It is so sad. What? I, I don't crazy. even think, I'm trying to remember. I think I was like 19 before I actually saw snow. Because in the, where I am in Texas, it, you know, never gets that cold uh, and that wet at the same time. But yeah, like that nippiness in the air and you hear Christmas carols and all that kind of stuff. People were saying Merry Christmas. And then, of course, like midway through my very short life, everyone got into the debate of like, do you say Merry Christmas or Happy Holidays? And so people were saying Happy Holidays. But see, when they started saying Happy Holidays, I realized at that age that everyone celebrated Christmas but it started to not make sense why a large section of the population, right? The secularists, the worldlings, as the saints called them, right? Atheists celebrate Christmas because Christmas is a Christian, it's a Catholic holiday. And so by analogy, if an atheist was to celebrate a Catholic holiday, right? And secularize it, it would be like me as a Catholic trying to secularize Ramadan and sell a bunch of stuff and celebrate. It would not make any sense. It wouldn't be not just fitting, but it wouldn't make any sense at all because I'm not Muslim, right? I'm a Catholic. And so in that same vein, to me, it doesn't make sense why an atheist would celebrate Christmas. One could maybe retort, well, Christmas is a time for family. It's a time for gifts. It's a time for good food, for fellowship. But really all of those things you can do whenever. And if you want to say, well, let's have a dedicated holiday to that, well, then make a dedicated holiday to that. It doesn't make sense to choose a day in which Christians are going to mass to celebrate the birth of the risen Savior, the birth of Christ. And so, yeah, it doesn't make any sense. It becomes cringe. And it's honestly insane whenever you hear people say like, you know, Merry Christmas or let's celebrate Christmas. But they also don't believe in or definitely don't want to follow the risen or birthed Lord. So that's my well, thoughts in general on the subject. It makes me think about how many Protestants celebrate Halloween and they don't actually understand uh -huh. the roots of Holotide at all. And so the argument could be made, I mean, for, for most Protestants who don't even believe that you should, that you should pray to the dead, even though we don't believe that the saints are dead um, and that they're actually more alive than we are now. Um, I don't under, <laughs> sorry, my kids are asking for food. Hold on. Oh, you're good. <laughs> Food is very important, y'all, just like Christmas. But you know who doesn't celebrate Christmas right? Atheists. That's who. So that's just how it be. That's just how it be. But in, in a general sense, I think that analogy is a good one just because, like, 
Um, oh, one Peter five logo. That's interesting. You got all kinds of people hanging out here. Um, one Peter five. You got for my kids. Oh goodness. Oh no, we didn't, I didn't hear him. See, every, you would have gotten away with it. No one would have even noticed. But they you just, you let the cat slip out of the bag. So I can't help it. I can't. But it's a good it. it's a good argument you make because it, it that is an, an interesting point. It's like same as Valentine's Day, St. Valentine's Day, St. Patrick's Day. They don't they celebrate St. Patrick's Day and St. Valentine's Day, but they're not even acknowledging the saints that they're attributed to. Oh, Christmas, 100%. same thing. Saint Nicholas. Notice, notice how a lot of the Catholic holidays the world has used to turn on its head and promote various vices. So it's like, for instance, yes. with St. Valentine's Day, unbridled immoral passions, right? Fornication, adultery, homosexuality, things like that. When it comes to St. Patrick's Day, right? Unabound drunkenness, gluttony, things like that. You could also, um, even in, even though Thanksgiving Day is not a historic Catholic holiday in the context of the United States, secular culture promotes it as a day of gluttony, right? And you mm -hmm. could even say that thing about Halloween, right? We should be, one can make the argument that, you know, for Halloween or at least the eve prior that you know traditionally the church has always employed fasting because we need to remember our death remember that you know the spiritual life is more important than the needs of the body though the needs of the body aren't bad enough themselves of course um but we promote it by gluttony and by the promotion of witchcraft right things well along that, nature. that and it's totally used in, as an excuse to be immodest as well That's i mean there's true. That's a, I mean, it, it, and I think that is wrapped up into the occult. And then, of course, Christmas is materialism, consumerism, Publicness, avarice, um, avarice, hundred yeah. percent. Yes, yeah, that's and really so, interesting. So it's like all of these holidays you do that. You see that with Easter too. It's like Easter. I don't feel like is really celebrated as much by the pagan world uh, as the other holidays, but you still do see a fair amount of it because you'll go and you'll see Easter decorations. But then it's like. There's some interesting, even psychological connotations that you get with e with Easter and with Christmas. So, for instance, you see with Christmas, the big secular character is Santa Claus, right? Now, I'm not here to bash the, the idea of Santa Claus. I'm separating Santa Claus from St. Nicholas, of course. But the secular idea of Santa Claus, they've made, in a certain sense, kind of like a godlike figure because he sees you when you're sleeping, he knows when you're awake, he knows if you're bad or good, and he rewards you based off of those things, right? So, Are you saying that they're believing in works-based salvation well you could say that i'm just saying like in the sense that they you could take that yeah. and transport that to an american archetype of god which is yes. maybe not so much works-based but it's um be good and god will give you the things it you is want prosperity you gospel yeah exactly and same thing even with easter because notice how easter at least in the context of children is generally presented as a time of when the Easter bunny comes and you get a bunch of physical monetary things, as opposed to focusing in on the reality that this man, the God man rose from the dead, conquered death and is here to save the world and to establish his reign over mankind. And so when you lump all these secular holidays together, Christmas of course is the nearest, you see how the world and the devil has co-opted these things into, um, debase hedonistic pleasures and uh sal uh, you know um si like sensual desires um become the priority over the spiritual life and so mm -hmm. the question i think therefore is you know what should catholics do about that into context one in their in their personal life and then two in societal life yeah i'm, I'm like thinking about all of these things that you're saying too and and that the atheist then has to ask themselves why why are they doing this? Is it be, is it really because they want to just spend special time with their family? Is there, is, do they have this deep seated desire to be close to God? I mean, I do think spirituality or religion is written on our hearts. We're actually ordered towards that naturally. That's why if you, mm -hmm. if you don't have faith in, in a certain religion, you will fill it up with something. You will make something an idol in your life, whether it's politics or um, health, music, like all these other things can become gods in our lives. Um, 
And it is interesting to look at how that plays out differently for all of these different holidays. I don't know. Like, what are your thoughts then, even for the atheists too? I mean, we, we need to talk about what Christians should do and how to prepare properly and have a proper disposition. But what about atheists? Like, what would you, if you were sitting down face to face with an atheist right now and they were telling you about their plans for Christmas, what they're doing today, by the time mm -hmm. our viewers are watching this or yesterday, um, what would you say to them? I would probably just ask them first why they're celebrating Christmas and try to first determine their, their cause for their celebratory actions. But then after that, I would, you know, because 99% of them are going to probably say things like, you know, this is a time that I get to spend with my family. This, you know, whether it be, you know, uh, close relatives or through their, you know, maternal family or something like that. Um, or if they're going to say, you know, it's a time of gift giving, or it's just a time to relax and not be at work, kind of just kick back and look back upon upon the year. My question is, is why are you using a Catholic holiday in order to do that? You know, most atheists are leftists. And so I would say, is that not cultural appropriation in a way, because you're stealing somebody else's holiday, but then reinventing it for yourself? You know, wouldn't you find that offensive? And of course, they law if they were being logical, they would say yes. Um, but leftism is not logical at all. And so they're probably going to say that, you know, original Christmas is white supremacy or something like that. Um, and so that would be- And then they'll remind you that Jesus wasn't white. Yes, yes. They'll, they'll like to focus on his DNA or something like that. Um, a, a, as they also hate Hebrew people as well, it seems, in these past couple months. Um, and so I would probably ascertain what they're doing for that. But then I would go on to share with them the reality of the gospel, which is that the purpose of Christmas- is that the world was in darkness, right? Even going all the way back to, for instance, January, or excuse me, June 24th, right? Which I believe is the uh, the, birth, the feast day of St. John the Baptist, the birth of St. John the Baptist. The reason that the church picks that is it's either on or near the summer solstice. Yeah. And so the sun is becoming darker and darker. And so the reality is that when St. John the Baptist says, he must increase so that I may, or I must decrease so that he may increase, We've been building up since that midpoint of the of the natural year to the reality that as the world becomes darker and darker, it can remind us of not just the darkness of the first century with the pagan world, but the darkness right now. See, we oftentimes focus in on, and this is correct, the darkness that was going on in year one, if you were, right, year zero, looking at the birth of Christ. And we can talk about the Roman Empire, how dark it was, the hedonistic world. But then the beautiful thing about Advent and Christmas is that we can compare our own time to that. All the darkness of our personal life, all the darkness of sin, all the darkness of the secular world, and we can say, we need a savior. So it's always every year repeating the same gospel story of man needs a savior, the world is dark, and then Christ comes in a very humble way with, through the mother of all virtues and decides to save mankind for the glory of his father. And so when Christ came 2,000 years ago in Bethlehem's major, it was to fulfill the mission of bringing his father glory and saving souls. So then therefore, my final question to the atheist is, what is your response? Maybe we'd have to go through some practical apologetics after that point. But in the, in the general sense, that is the purpose of Christmas. That is the purpose to remember. And so if we're focusing in on, as primary, family, friends, food, gifts, all of which aren't bad in and of themselves, but if we make that the focal point, then we become a problem. Here's a good way to test whether or not it's a focal point for you. Are you going to go to Mass on Christmas Day because it is a holy day of obligation? Or are you just going to be like, well, you know, it doesn't really matter. I'll make it up later. You know, I'll, I'll just commit mortal sin and risk my my, my eternal salvation. I'll, I'll push the meaning um, of Christmas off. I will willfully disobey our Lord and say that, you know, he does not have rights over me to command me as he would. I'll just celebrate how I want. That's a problem, right? That's a problem. And so... Mm -hmm. We should all examine our conscience and say, what are we going to do this Christmas? Are we going to celebrate the birthday of our Lord? Are we going to remember these truths? Or are we just going to, in a certain sense, live like the pagans and just co-opt it and make it what we want? Yeah, I think that's a really good point. So, I, well, now I feel like I have to ask you what, do you, what do you guys do for Christmas? Yeah, my Christmas is always interesting. At least it has been over the last five years because I'm the only Catholic in my family. Um, and so, or at least in my immediate family. Mm -hmm. but I remember the first, the first few times, uh, of, for, for Christmas, I would always get like uh, at least a fair amount of complaints that I was going to go to mass on Christmas day, but I was just like, you know, 
doesn't matter. I'm going to mass. I'm pretty, th thank the Lord he's given me graces to just kind of be resolute and just, I'm going to mass. I don't care. This is just how it is. I generally get every year though, that's kind of subsided over the last couple of years. They kind of mm -hmm. just expect it now, but I do every year get, uh, this is, this brings up a good subject for, for all of our viewers. Oftentimes if you're hanging out with family, and they're not of the Catholic religion, they might invite you to a Protestant service or a Protestant like Eve service or Eve Eve service or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. When I was a kid, again, I grew up in the evangelical world and we would go to every year on the 23rd, the Christmas Eve Eve service because oddly enough, liberalism has penetrated so deep even into conservative evangelicalism that they don't want to celebrate on the 25th, even if it's a Sunday or just oh, because yes. they're like, you know, that's the day we hang out with family. We'll celebrate Christ's birth together like two or three days before. But it was always so funny because number one, you have that big philosophical inconsistency of, is he really your Lord or is your family your Lord or your society your Lord or presence your Lord? But then yeah. two, at the same time, on a on a, on a in a manifestation sense we would also use candles this is the only service where everyone would have candles you know that they'd be holding during this this service which everyone always loved but it goes to show you how sacramentology how we are a sacramental um species if you will we desire mystery we desire um ceremony even if people have stripped all the ex like, like symbols and signs right like things exactly. that are going to point us to greater things it's so funny that you bring this up because we we're planning on going to eat or Christmas vigil while well, we we're, you know, going to mass Saturday vigil and then Christmas Eve um, mass because we love getting up with the kids in the morning, having a huge Christmas breakfast and like just hanging out and enjoying our kids and making sure that we've we've done mass. And we it's so chaotic to try and get five kids out the door after presents and everything like that. It's just sheer chaos. So that's what we're planning on doing. And, and we're planning on um, going to my in-laws on Christmas Eve after we went to mass, right? Because we don't mm -hmm. want to celebrate Christmas until we have celebrated a Christmas liturgy. The last minute they changed plans because some of my in-laws didn't want to be up late with their kids, which I understand. We all have a lot of young kids, but now we're getting together Chris or Christmas Eve day before we have celebrated. So we'll go to mass in the morning for the Sunday liturgy. And then we don't know how, if we're going to go to midnight mass or go to Christmas mass um, on Christmas day, which is fine. But I had already planned out all of my, like, this is me as the mom. I've already planned out all of my preps and my food and everything to be done at a certain time. And now I have to shift everything because my in-laws want to celebrate Christmas on Christmas Eve day and not mm -hmm. after they've celebrated Christmas. And my husband was sort of like, well, isn't that okay? And I said, I mean, it's fine, but I, I like I actually have a problem celebrating Christmas before it's actually Christmas, before we've even celebrated a Christmas liturgy and welcomed Jesus into the manger. Um, it seems like we're putting the cart before the horse a little bit. And so that's that's like common then in, mm -hmm. in Protestant circle. OK, yeah, like I mean, there was years that I remember, um, like, for instance, at the 25th and the first right of January was on a Sunday. They would just be like, yeah, you know, we're not going to have services for the next two weeks. We'll catch you, you know, basically when the year starts. Um, and it, it's very, it's very interesting. Why? Because again, like classical liberalism is so in depth in the, in the American DNA and the Western European DNA that we have actually divorced the rights of our creator from us. We've made ourselves autonomous individuals who say, okay, I know God created me. And he has absolute rights over me because that would be the logical consequence of a creator over his creation. Right. But I'm going to separate my life because I'm an autonomous being and I'm going to live my life how I want to. And so I'll choose when I want to worship, how I want to worship, and when I want to worship. And that is something that is satanic because you are saying that in a certain sense, you are God, you are the creator of your own life, you are, you know, mm. you know it's your own manifest destiny. And in the context of people who come from um, mixed religious backgrounds like myself, right, with Catholics and Protestants in the same house, there is the temptation to, whether people know it or not, violate the first commandment by, in the virtue of faith, by going to a non-Catholic service. So I've always, um, this has always created tension in my family, but I've always been stalwart and saying, you know, as much as I love my mom and dad and my siblings, mm. etc., I'm not going to go to um, a rite of worship that is not 
um, given by divine origin, given by the Church of Christ. Um, it's not that I hate my parents or hate my siblings or hate any of the individuals who go to those things, but it's that if you believe that Christ is king and that he is Lord of the earth, then his word is law, and you can't just go about ever breaking his laws. You'd rather die than do that. And so Catholics, I would uh, in charity remind you that if you are asked to go to a non-Catholic service <clears throat> during this time of year, be kind, be charitable, don't be, and be patient with your relatives or your friends, but just simply explain that that is something that goes against your faith. It's not that you hate them or anything like that, but it's just something that you cannot participate in. Mm -hmm. Can you hear my kids? I just have to ask. No, no. <laughs> Lots of shouts of joy. <laughs> actual joy they're playing not like screaming because they're hungry and needy or something Mommy. i just want to make sure because it's really We're like mom food. never feeds us she spends I... all the time online oh no we made homemade pizza today and you know we had breakfast we did all that stuff i'm baking like a maniac right now trying to get ready for christmas so i was about uh, to say if everyone follows angela's instagram page they'll just see like all of her baking that's going on i love baking and cooking I, that's honestly one thing I like about this time of year is I'm not on my social media as much even. Um, and I just am cooking and baking and cleaning. It makes me like, oh, yeah, I remember there once was a time when I wasn't on social media at all. And it was fantastic. And I got mm -hmm. so much done. Um, yeah. So anyway, yeah, I, I have to agree. I'm glad that you brought up those points, too, about going to non-Catholic services. Because I think it's easy to want to accommodate or... Um, because we're fearful of wrecking relationships. I, I, at least from a, a female perspective, we're just very ordered towards connection. And so I think it's very typical for women. If we're invited on something, we feel bad saying no, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and, because we're worried about ruining relationships. And so sometimes we'll acquiesce and even maybe when we shouldn't. So um, I think that's a really good point. It's an interesting thing, though, you said with like how and you're right that women are ordered for connection. But here's my question. Connection with what? So Christ yeah, has invited right. you to have connection with him through the sacrifice of the mass through the holy his holy church. Or you can have connection with something that is not of Christ and mm -hmm. not of his mystical body. And so the question really comes down to, am I going to be a respecter of Christ or a respecter of man? Yeah. And what connection are you going to receive? Well, exactly. I think it's it's easy, though, to see the connection when you're talking about your family members. These are people you're seeing every day. You're hearing their voice. And if you're not rooted in prayer, you're not really seeing or hearing God as often either. And so um, it's definitely a good reminder to remain rooted in prayer in sacred scripture and to be recollecting that all the time. Um, yeah. I don't know. Do you have anything else to add to that? Yeah, 100 percent. It's like without a prayer life, you're not going to be able to stand because Christ is in uh, St. John's Gospel, chapter 15, that classic passage about how, um, you know, uh, I am the vine, you are the branches. But he says in verse four, a very beautiful phrase, which is that like in uh, without me, you can do nothing. Right. You have to abide in me and without me, you can do nothing. So if we're not abiding with Christ and we're not receiving the sacraments of Holy Eucharist and Holy Penance often, if we're not praying our rosary every day, if we're not at least spending, you know, a couple minutes, even at least in mental prayer every single day, if we're pushing off Christ, we are in a certain sense behaving like, again, a classical liberal by saying, I have my own rights and I can choose when I want to serve God, where I want to serve God, how I want to serve God. You may not be saying these things, but you start practically living like one. Mm -hmm. And we have to remember that if he is our Lord, then we have to have absolute fealty to him as his servants, as his serfs, if you will. Um, but he's the all good and gracious Lord. And so therefore, if you feel your, this tension, right, don't beat yourself up, but recognize that it's a time for you to approach the gracious one and to ask for graces, of course, with the assistance of Our Lady, the Mediatrix of all graces, to give you the grace necessary to start putting these things into practice. Be consistent even if you don't feel like it. Be consistent even if you're you're very busy throughout the day. That's the most important thing about growing the spiritual life is even if you're extremely busy throughout the day, you have to fight tooth and nail to continue to do your rule of life, the prayer rule, etc. Yeah, I'm just all of a sudden thinking about, too, all of the traditions that we have associated with Christmas explicitly. You know, th 
that's one of the best things about being Catholic is we have these, all of these traditions and they're rooted more often than not in the church and, you know, mm -hmm. through time and place, um, you know, putting up stockings, having Christmas trees, all these things. And atheists and Protestants do these things, even though they hate man-made tradition. Right. Mm -hmm. But all of these things are ordered towards giving glory to God. Um, I just I think that's so interesting. Like, what are your, some of your favorite Chris, Christmas traditions and do you know where they come from? Yeah. So one of my favorites. So I have like, you know, some fami some family Christmas traditions, but then more explicit religious ones. And so um, at least one of my absolute favorite Christmas traditions is that my family for a long time on my mom's side has always on Christmas Eve read the gospel account from St. Luke's gospel about the birth of Christ. So this was something that my grandfather did for a long time, and then he eventually kind of passed off to me to read the classic Christmas story. It's very good because we have to first dispose ourselves to um, reading the sacred text and understanding the, you know, the reason for the season, if you will, um, before engaging in anything else. Another thing is going to uh, the traditional midnight mass is uh, something that's very, very beautiful because it's literally starting the very beginning of the day with the solemn liturgy. And, you know, Latin mass in the context of the Christmas midnight mass is just beautiful. Hearing all of the beautiful chants and it's dark and you're seeing incense and candles and all kinds of things like that. Um, it's rightly ordering the day. And so you're right, because we are a, all man is religious. All man is spiritual. And liturgical. Like, I, like yeah. it's it's built into nature. You you can't not be liturgical. You have seasons. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's actually built into nature. And so mm -hmm. I, I, you can't avoid it. Even if you want to, you can't. And we're drawn to that. Like we, mm -hmm. I, I don't know about you, but like certain times of the year, you get a, for me, if I'm out in the fall and it, and I smell like cornfields, if I'm out in the cornfields, it brings me back to my teen years of living out in the country. Like I just, I can't, mm -hmm. same with the summer when the corn is really high. I, I detasseled corn one summer and it was just, there was always corn everywhere, but like the different smells that come with harvesting and everything like that, it brings me back. And, but it's not just that, of course, it's, it comes into Christmas traditions too. And all of a sudden you have all of the the pine needles and rosemary and orange and cranberry and all of these things. And um, so even if we, we wanted to separate ourselves from liturgy and seasonality, we just, we can't on a very physical, natural level where it's, it's built into our life. 100%. I think back uh, three or four years ago, I started to see all these evangelical groups starting to put out um, the advent candles and things like that in the context of their services, which I always thought was kind of funny. Because again, like the more and more I watch the Protestant world, the conservative Protestant world, the more and more Catholic I see them becoming slowly over time. Okay, but weren't okay. advent wreaths actually started in, in the Lutheran church? That's actually my understanding. There's, I've heard debate back and forth. I've never actually known where it originates from. Um, so it might start in the Lutheran church. But I guess maybe you could say, even if it did, there's always this liturgical aspect yes. of mystery and is it from the Lutheran church? Yep. The concept of the Advent wreath originated among German Lutherans in the 16th century. However, it was not until three centuries later that the modern Advent wreath took shape. Oh, okay. So I guess yeah. like the modern Advent wreath is something that's kind of more unique to like a more modern time. Interesting. I guess there's more, I guess there's, there's, there's things that are more than just the new mass that are Lutheran. Anyway, um, yeah, I would say you see, you can see conservative evangelicalism becoming more liturgical over time with the use of candles, with the use of liturgical covers. I mean, they'll even say like, you know, we're celebrating Advent now, which I think is is funny. But yeah, we're naturally liturgical and seasonal people, and so we're always going to be desirous of some kind of experience that is going to be unique, um, even if it is just like a very low church style group. And so, I guess the question that I'm interested in is. What do Catholics do on a societal level to kind of start to push back against what we've seen co-opted? Because the problem I see is that there seems to be a great spirit of timidity over the Catholic population. Perhaps it, I think it's, a, I think it comes from several things. One, I think it comes from the fact that we all grow up in a secularly liberal society, which says to, you know, tolerate all different organizations and groups. 
um, which is incorrect because it is um, trying to strip away the rights of Christ the King from society. But two, I also think that we have the spirit of timidity because a lot of our leaders don't um, really stand up for anything. I mean, the fact that the best we do is we say, you know, keep Christ in Christmas, don't call it Xmas, but that's about it, um, I think is sad. So in your opinion, what do you think is maybe a practical solution? Because I have a few ideas myself, but what do you think is a practical solution to Catholics starting to, in a societal level, start to push back against culture and to reform culture? Day's fault. I'm just kidding. Day's fault. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I just think we can't be afraid to be Catholic anymore. I mean, I, I mean, I get it's not easy right now, especially when there's so much confusion. I feel like I'm there's that meme of the of the angel uh, statue, like, you know, totally ashamed, that kind of thing, like, oh, annoyed. Yeah. And I sort of feel like that all the time. And I'm I am dreading. I, I know we're recording this before Christmas, but I'm I'm kind of dreading going to Christmas with my in-laws. I'm hoping that they don't bring up all the stuff that that has been oh, coming you know, out. You know they're going to. Oh, I There's know. And I just don't want to talk about it because I'm like, it's embarrassing. But probably good catechesis on what, what the church actually teaches about the papacy and the history of the Catholic Church in terms of... Um, you know, not always having great popes. And yeah, this might be one of the worst times in the church history. Like, I think there's a strong argument that could be made there, um, even though there's good legitimate debate about that. I think, uh, you, could, I think you could even just, you don't even have, I mean, you. I think you should do all that, what you said. But if you're just wanting like a one-liner statement, you could just be like, yeah, the Pope's teaching error all the time these days. And then that's literally, you just move on from there. You know, yeah. just to, to say like, yeah, he's not teaching Catholic truth right now. He's just teaching um, basically the whims of the world. And then you just move on from that, you know? Yeah. I mean, you don't have to engage. I, it's, it's hard because I want, I love my in-laws so much, for example, and, and other people in my life too. Like I've talked about my sister who is in a quote unquote gay civil marriage and, um, and it's hard to dance around some difficult conversations. Sometimes, sometimes we're able to have those direct conversations and other times it's like, you have to know when to pick your battles and it's an issue of prudence. And I do think as Catholics, we have to be prudent and, and discerning. We need to be rooted in prayer more. Honestly, we need to be praying more and focusing on cultivating holiness in our lives instead of obsessing over what's going on in the world or what some Catholic YouTuber said, um, or did, it's just not helping the church right now. The church is really hurting. And I can see why there are people who maybe would ignore what the church has to say right now, or are choosing to be atheists or don't want to partake in the fullness of truth. Um, but that's because we're not living it out well. At the end of the day, it's because the church is not doing a good job living out her mission. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not the fault of the church. It's our fault. So I think the first thing we need to do as Catholics is really ask ourselves, what am I doing to cultivate holiness in my life? Am I living a life that is grow, helping me grow in virtue? And am I loving God more every single day? Or am I navel gazing more time <laughs> than not? Um, and if, if you think you might be doing any navel gazing, which I think most of us are for you know, in some, in some degree or another, um, we have to root that out. And I think when people see holiness or see differences in our hearts and in our dispositions, that is intriguing to them. Um, mm -hmm. they, they're inspired by that. And I think about all the people in my life that have inspired me and it's like, yeah, those people that have inspired me, it's, it's really been their humility. Um, and, and their honest disposition. I don't know. So I think those are the things that we have to cultivate, uh, we need to be doing a better job and, um, and then, yeah, just not be afraid to be Catholic. You know, if somebody asks you something or, um, or if, if you feel like there are things that need to be done, this is where I fall. This is where I fall short a lot, especially as a mom. Um, it's really easy to get caught up in housework and things like that. There are always things that need to be done. And so what always suffers my prayer right. life. My mm -hmm. prayer life always suffers because I am prioritizing getting these things done than sitting down and in, in, engaging in mental prayer with our Lord. 
And I know that that's a fault that I have. It's, it's these perfectionistic tendencies that I have that are ordered towards productivity. And that's a problem that I have. I need to surrender that to God. And so that's another question for all of us. We have to start asking ourselves, why am I doing the things that I'm doing? Like, what is, what are the wounds in my life that are drawing me back into these same mistakes over and over again? What am I trying to heal here? Why do I feel like I have to be doing this and start healing those things? And that's another area too, is like letting God into those things, but we have to be self-reflective. Um, and when we grow in those ways too, like people notice I've had people in my life who have said, you know, you've really changed a lot. I'm like, thanks be to God. Praise be to God that I've changed because, um, and I have a long way to go, which also praise be to God. He gets to continue to work in my life. Um, but yeah, I mean, people notice those things and it's inspiring to them. So that's what I want to see more Catholics doing. I want them to focus less on what the church has going on right now, even though it's, it's important. I don't want to understate that. But I think more than anything, the only way we're going to fix that in the church right now, what's going on is really by fixing ourselves first and our families. Yeah. I guess there's like four things that come to mind, like four categories. Oh, that's it? <laughs> yeah, just four. Like I categorize everything because I'm a Thomas. So it's like, first, you have to start with yourself and strive for personal holiness. Mm -hmm. If you're not living a life of personal holiness, of, pra of, of actively and willfully practicing the virtues, asking God for the grace to allow the gifts of the Holy Ghost to become, um, they're already present in your life if you're baptized in the state of grace, but to become active in your life, more active and more manifest. Uh, striving for that's very important. Um, but yeah, if you're not doing that, that can be very concerning because as St. Alphonsus talks about in his moral theology, if you're the type of person, if um, I'm blanking on the exact scholastic term and all, uh, phrase, um, but it's basically a repetitive sinner, you know, habitual sinner who's kind of just going back and forth using the confessional as a revolving door. That's something in, in the context of mortal sin, right? That, mm -hmm. That's the big thing. In that context, um, that's very worrying because you're basically playing, you know, Russian roulette with your soul. That's very, very worrisome. You only have one soul. If we were to have unlimited souls, you know, people would just be committing all the sins all the time. It didn't matter if one soul was to fall into mortal sin because you'd have another soul and you could just keep going. But you have one mortal soul. And you need to treat it well. It reminds me of the story of St. John Bosco, right? Who was very concerned about the poor young boys who didn't have the faith and didn't have confessors to teach them the faith. And so he worked all his life and prayed to Our Lady uh, Help of Christians to save souls. But uh, he felt bad because he remembered because, you know, for those of you guys who don't know St. John Bosco, he could read souls. And he knew one boy who was uh, had only committed one mortal sin his entire life, um, but he was so um ashamed to confess it right and, and mm. would never confess it and uh, saint john bosco could read his soul and he felt very sad well unfortunately the boy died never confessing his sin and the boy ended up appearing to him you know if you will from the flames of hell talking about how much he regretted that right and so even if it's mm. just one we have to be very concerned second category is when it comes to families especially if you are a parent to recognize that the duty of a parent to form their children as good catholics is as important as the priest who has to form his entire congregation. Yeah. You have to treat your children as a fellow Christian, as a fellow, if you will, for lack of better terms, brother and sister in the Lord, which is kind of an interesting concept to meditate on, um, treating them with that charity, with that patience. Um, but you're also supposed to be the main instructor of them. So warning of them about mortal sin, encouraging them in the love of Christ that transforms their lives, being their greatest supporter in all things that are lawful and their greatest deterrer in all things that are unlawful. Yeah. That's very important. The third category, uh, at least in the broader context, is that at least in the context of society, we all have to be, whether it be parents or priests or even young people, pushing for the societal social kingship of Christ, because if we're wanting to have youth or even just ourselves be in a society which is much better, it has to be a society which honors God. So for instance, you can't have a household that's functional if every parent says, okay, freedom of religion, you guys do what you want, your religion's personal and private, and that's all that it is. Can you picture how crazy that is? But a lot of Protestant parents do this. Like, exactly. I'm not going to take my child to any one church. I want my child to choose for themselves. It's like, well, we don't let our kids choose how they're educated. We don't let our kids mm -hmm. choose 
whether or not, I mean, you might choose to allow your kid to get baptized later in life, but I mean, you're making a choice for them in their infancy, whether you realize it or not, you're making a choice one way or another. Um, exactly. Their medical care, everything. You make choices for your children all the time. And a lot of them have gone from that role for some reason. It's very evil, I think, to because, neglect to form your children that way. Yeah, because Satan is, he, he does not care if you take care of them on a physical level, an emotional level. He just wants their soul to be derailed and for them to build up into their mind that they are the determiners of their own life, right? It mm -hmm. is this classical liberal thinking that has so infected the minds of people. And so pushing for that on a societal level is very important. I think the practical ways you do that is by Catholics joining together into active fellowships and apostolates to do active campaigning in their society to not just do, for instance, what I did this summer with protesting immorality, but also to try to elect good and faithful people to instill laws in society. And the fourth and final thing I'd say, at least in this in this category, is that when it comes to the matters of the church, the laity have an absolute right, and I would say duty, to speak out against immorality going on. One, for the sake of their own children not being scandalized. If, yeah. their if the children are being told by their parents, you know, X is a sin, but then you also see the parents choosing to say nothing about what is going on. They will not have any respect for you growing up. They will say, my parents were cowards. They did not stand up for what they believed. I don't know if any of this is true. I'm just going to go off and do my things. They will respect you 110% more if you're at least consistent and say, we have to fight for what we believe. And that's exactly what the saints did. It doesn't mean that we don't, um, you know, strive to be humble, strive to be patient, strive to be understanding. But it's also that we cannot allow uh, a sin that cries to heaven for vengeance to become even somewhat normal in our society, right? That's something that is, that's going to be very grave. So all this put together, when it comes to all four, you have to be rooted in Christ, but then Christ transforms you so that you can go out and transform civil society, your family, and the church, right? Ultimately, mm -hmm. I don't even like using the term like saving the church or transforming the church because truly it's the church that saves you. But right. I guess saving the dead members in the church that are trying to lead people astray. Well, I mean, how many times do we see in the Old Testament? I mean, you just think about all of the types in the Old Testament of the church mm -hmm. um, or or Jesus. Like <laughs> you think I was just uh, I think it was when I interviewed Joshua Charles on my channel. He brought up the. Uh, type of Jonah in the whale being dead for three days and spit back up to proclaim the gospel, even though Jonah didn't want to, but our Lord, he wanted to, that was his mission, right? That was what he was here for was to, to open up the gates of heaven and, and share, share the good news for us. Um, but even the church, like looking at Noah's Ark and realizing how much filth had to have been on that Ark. I mean, it's, it's like gross. You read about it and it talks about creeping, crawling things being on there and all these animals and even unclean animals. Um, Have you ever thought about like oh. Noah's four sons who had to clean that thing? Oh, oh man. No. The stinking ship. Yeah. I mean, this isn't funny, but it's like, no wonder Noah was a drunk after that. I mean, it would be awful. I mean, you think about it, it would be awful to be in that environment. And yet they did it. They like they did it and God rewarded them for that and, re and rewarded the world, really. I mean, he just saved the world uh, by starting fresh that way. Um, yeah, I mean, there's just there are going to be difficult times. And I, I understand why atheists maybe would be skeptical or Protestants would be skeptical of the truth of the church right now. And that's it's like we we ourselves then have to be people where they see that we are not duplicitous and we, um, we really love God. Like we mm -hmm. really want to be near to him and we want to evangelize and bring other people to, to even a really dirty ship right now, but it is the bark that will save the church, you know, save the world. So yeah, yeah. my parents, my parents respect me way more that I'm actually trying to fight for the good than if I was to do nothing, because again, you know, my parents aren't Catholic. They're looking at things from an outside perspective, but when they see like the word that they use to describe what's going on, and again, they're just getting it from basically the run of the mill news cycle right. is it seems like there's a lot of evil people in the church. There's a lot of evil people um, in high places doing evil actions, but it's so funny. Even today, while I was in my holy hour, I got a text message from my mom who sends me this article of this bishop who's calling out the problems right now. 
Uh, and it's like, okay, the fact that my mom finds these things, she'll at least respect us more that we're trying to do something than mm -hmm. if we're just kind of like, um, you know, let's just start a new church. Yeah. Like start a new church or just like hide and bury our head in the sand. Like, I feel mm -hmm. like for the last decade or so, we've been kind of giving the faithful the advice of just bury your head in the sand, live your own life and do your own thing. And while there's some merit to that, because again, it's like, if on the one hand you're only watching negative stuff, then you're going to naturally like start to fall apart and deteriorate. And so in that context, I think it's fine. But in a much broader context, it's like, you know what you could do? You don't even have to be on YouTube. Why don't you just raise like 20, 20, like single guys out there, get 20 other single guys and start protesting this. Go down to where you know like immorality is happening. Like if there's these blessings down at your local parish, go outside and protest. That would be way more – like I mean what 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 difference is there at that point between an Episcopalian quote-unquote church and what's going on there? You know, like you would, push, you would uh, protest an abortion clinic, wouldn't you? You'd protest this type of morality, I would hope. And so doing something active in your community as well as praying – I think is going to be is so much more better than just looking at the negative thing and doing essentially nothing about it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I agree. I mean, something has to be done. And I think, unfortunately, a lot of our priests have sort of been, uh, I don't know, strong armed into silence or, you know, there are just different. Sadly, there are a lot of politics that are played in the church and that's just any institution. It's not just the church. And that's the thing that I think, we have to remind people that every institution that is run by a man that has any sort of human involved, it could be your local Protestant church, they have their own politics. Your The Lutheran church, the evangelical church, they all have dynamics involved. There's politics and family. There are politics and family. It's it's just that's, that's our fallen nature. Of course, the church is not going to be immune to that. Um, but that doesn't mean you're right that we we sit by and, and just sort of watch things unfold and say, well, it's out of our hands. And in a, in a way, it is out of our hands. But we can also support our good priests, too. I think that often is overlooked, praying for our priests and being serious about that and also vo vocalizing your support for your priests, um, asking your bishop to do the right thing. I mean, I've had, unfortunately, experiences of reaching out to our archbishop about things happening in our diocese that should not be happening, like uh, giving a platform to LGBTQ stuff in parishes and celebrating that during Pride Month. Um, and I went unanswered, unfortunately. And that really, that makes me sad. I mean, I try, I try to be pretty charitable and stuff. And so you just realize that there's, we do have an uphill battle, but we can't just sit by and watch it as, as it unfolds. Like you have to be engaged. That's how I feel about the abortion issue too. People would could say, well, abortion is going to happen no matter what. And yeah, I mean, even if it's illegal, it's going to probably still happen. Is it going to happen as often? No. Yeah. It's like, what about like, if we were to take this context and put this in the context of, you know, chattel slavery in the mid 18th century and early 19th century, it's like, so if the argument is, you know, okay, just, don't go down to the slave docks. Don't expose yourself to evil and just go back and pray and you'll feel better about it. It's like, right. it uh, well, there's people being trafficked and that's bad. And I should, even if I can't ultimately change the end, I can do my best. Cause you're right. It's like in the one hand sense, the final end or the final cause is in the hands of God, 110%. But we cooperate with grace. We cooperate with God just like you see all the Old Testament patriarchs, they cooperated with God. All the New Testament apostles, they cooperated with God. All the saints, they did the same. We're told be saints. Well, being a saint doesn't just mean be a contemplative cloistered monk. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's fine. You should do that if you're if you're called to that. And in every way, we should all, in a certain sense, in our state and life, emulate elements of that. But at the same time, we have to be sometimes like our Lord who goes out and he says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you put stumbling blocks in the way of people who are trying to receive salvation. Mm -hmm. Is that not what is going on today? Doesn't mean that you have deep-seated ha hatred for the papacy. Doesn't mean that you, you're not charitable to people. Christ is charity itself. But sometimes evil has to be called out, right? Because charity, according to St. Paul, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Mm 
-hmm. So therefore, if we know, like for instance, in your example, that your archdiocese or your diocese is uh, at least giving, um, you know, kind of a wink and a nudge, if you will, to the supporters of the sodomite agenda, then you have to be, to the best of your ability, oppositional to that. It doesn't mean that you get a megaphone and you walk into every church and start screaming or something, but it's that you let people know, like, this is wrong. We can't do this. We have to band together to survive. And Christ will reward you tenfold in the context of merit um, for defending his faith. Yeah. And I think too, this is how we bring, I think this is part of living out a good Christian life being, you know, we're supposed to engage civilly and even within the church, like we're not just supposed to hide away in our homes all the time. Um, even though that is our most important work. Um, but we live in community with each other. We're called to communion and we can't be in communion with one another if there are people living outside of communion. So how do we bring them back in? How do you bring people back to the truth? How do you call them to something deeper? Um, and this goes for people who are living uh, maybe lifestyles that we're not not in accord with or that, that God has ex expressly condemned. Um, but also the atheists, all of these people. And that's the thing is this time of year, I think, is a good time of year for bringing people together. Um, mm -hmm. Because Christ does naturally bring people together. That's, that's what he does. He, he's, he wants unity. He's the Prince of peace. Um, and so hopefully this season, as we, we celebrate the Christmas season, it's not a day, it's a season. Um, hopefully we can find more ways to reach out to people in love and charity. Like you said, because Christ is love it, itself. He is charity. Um, but this is a good time maybe for us to try and bring back our atheist brothers and sisters, um, our brothers and sisters who are maybe confused and, relishing some of the new confusion that has been introduced, or maybe others who are saying, you know, this is really making me think twice about being Catholic. Um, mm -hmm. because there's that, that there's a lot of that going on right now too. So, um, let's use the insanity of atheist Christmas to do good things. Oh, a hundred percent, hundred percent. It, it you, you saying that kind of reminds me of, I was at adoration earlier and there was this lady who was leaving and she was going about saying Merry Christmas to people. And I got this Not close. Yet. I was thinking, I was actually thinking like if she was to come to me like, oh, Merry Christmas, little boy. I was just going to be like, little boy. <laughs> yeah, because she's, you know, the older lady. They, she they she would have me. given you a little pinch on the cheek. And... I would have been like, abuse, abuse. <laughs> Take your hands <laughs> off me. Uh, I was just going to, I was already mentally prepared if she was going to come over to me and say Merry Christmas, be like Happy Advent as well. <laughs> that so, is so much. You would too. Oh, 100%. Because it's like, it's so funny. It's taken me five years, but now I'm in the Catholic mindset of like, okay, this is Advent. Christmas starts on Christmas Day, and it mm. goes throughout the debatable season, inevitably. People debatable. Like, we can debate about that in, in our next show. That actually would be funny. We Let's should see. have a, a good Advent show. That would be fun. Or like, a, I'm sorry, good New Year show. Grab a drink and just have topics. People, if you're listening to this right now, you should put in the comments the things that we should cover. Just like any questions you want, debates you want to see us have, and we should just do that. That would be a fun New Year show. 100% would be funny. Well, do you have any final thoughts before we wrap things up? Um, Just, you know, go out and be saints. Don't be timid and always see Christ. And then um, if you're wanting to see something that is like a little bit more, um, I would say, uplifting in this season of confusion, I just published out on the show about a week and a half ago my first kind of amateur documentary called salvation by the light it was my experience of living for 30 days in a traditional benedictine monastery and reading the summa somehow cover to cover in that 30-day time period and so if you're wanting to see kind of a, a little bit of high quality video but also more of a reflective style video from me it's not so much a lecture it's like a reflection um yeah go over and check it out it's on the traditional Thomas salvation by the light and uh, i think you'll like it it's pretty high quality pretty fun I need to, I feel bad. I haven't watched it yet because I haven't watched anything over the last few weeks. I've been hiding away. I don't know what's going on on Catholic YouTube, but I'm going to, after this, after we're done recording, I'm going to go watch it. Um, yeah. And I don't have much going. I mean, I'm going to be doing a embroidery episode with our friend Darren, who's also known as the Red Rover champ over on Twitter. But last year he taught me how to cross stitch on like a chill stream. And now he's teaching me how to do embroidery. <laughs> so you guys can grab a drink, come on over to integrated. I, actually, what's so funny is that this is 
those streams, those chill streams have been some, uh, some people's favorite streams that I've done. So it's been a year where I was like, all right, let's do it again. Let's go have a good time, relax, maybe get away from a, some of the political chaos and just have a good mm -hmm. time. Um, and then I will actually have, I do have some interviews lined up for January, but I don't want to say exactly what they are yet. Um, but I think they're going to be good. Some of them are going to be um, very controversial a little bit. I'm going to out myself right now as, as kind of an anti-vaxxer. And so I'm going to be bringing somebody on to talk about that. Um, so stay tuned. Make Angela sure you come on have, over. Yeah. Angela and I have somehow gotten Donald Trump, Joe Biden, and Robert Kennedy Jr. on separate interviews to all show up on the show. So if you guys yes. want to see that. Then <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. The debate Wouldn't will be, be on something. Show. Okay. Debate on integrated with I'll Andrew. just like have somebody with a Joe Biden mask just sitting there. So that <laughs> That'd be so creepy. So creepy. Maybe sniffing like right here. Just, yeah. yeah. Just the, yeah. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's weird. Oh, that, I mean, it's not like he does much anything. Exactly. Anyway. So anyway, on that note, <laughs> <laughs> thanks for joining us for another edition of The Ascent. Thank you so much. Well, God bless you guys. And we hope that you have a very wonderful and very Merry Christmas.